Hello. Um, we're going to be continuing our, our look at political justice. Uh, and uh, remember how we left off with uh, the Hobbes reading, right? We left off pointing out that Hobbes makes a couple of testable predictions, right? Hobbes uh, brings up this idea of the, this Leviathan, right? This, this organ, this, you know, entity essentially, whose job it is uh, to enforce a monopoly on violence, right? And so the idea is that that's one function of a government is to kind of enforce a monopoly on violence, uh, to, to you know, be the only legitimate user of violence in a society. And so, uh, again, he makes a kind of testable prediction. Uh, as Leviathans, that as governments get larger, more well-organized and more powerful, we ought to see uh, rates of violence decrease. So anytime you want to talk about or think about uh, violence and what it's done historically and why, uh, you should take a look at a, a book called The Better Angels of Our Nature, from which uh, our reading is, is actually a little piece of a chapter uh, of, of this uh, much, much larger book. It's a very big book, but it's a, a very good book. I think it's one of the best books written in, in about a century. Um, and I don't, I don't say that lightly. I've read a lot of really good books. Um, but I'd recommend it reading for anybody. Its author is uh, Steven Pinker, who's a, a, a Harvard uh, scholar. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let's, let's take a look at uh, Pinker's analysis. Now, Pinker points out that, that one, a person could subscribe to one of a couple of ideas about where violence comes from. That's, you know, in, in some sense, uh, a person might have one or two, one of two theories of, of the nature of violence, what violence is like. In its, in its essence. You could have uh, what's called a, a hydraulic view or a hydraulic theory of violence, where you could have this strategic theory of violence, right? The hydraulic theory of violence is the idea that violence results from sort of violent urges or pressures, right? You, if, if that's your view, you think that's what violence is really like. Um, it's, uh, you know, it just sort of bubbles up and busts out eventually, right? Uh, the hydraulic in the sense of, you know, pressure. Uh, or you could have something like uh, that's called the strategic uh, theory of violence, which which is the idea that violence occurs when uh, out of out of means and rationality. That is, when somebody believes that they uh, can get something by violence with uh, less cost than they could by other means, or more effectively than they could by other means. Uh, that is, when it's a good strategy, they'll use it, and and that's you know that's these are very very different views. Uh, the way that Pinker puts it, he says, uh, he wants to say, he calls hydraulic violence uh, sort of this thirst for blood or a death wish or a killer instinct or other destructive itches, urges, and impulses, right? So uh, this hydraulic theory of violence, I think, to some extent, thinks that violence is sort of built into our natures or something like that. Whereas strategic violence, well, it's also an aspect of our nature, but it's an aspect of our rationality rather than some sort of urge or itch or uh, sort of, you know, impulse to destruction. Uh, so the strategic uh, theory of strategic violence uh, would say that violence would only happen in circumstances where the expected benefits outweigh the expected costs uh, versus other methods. So uh, clearly, um, uh, if you, 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 should, you should be thinking about what sort of, uh, which picture seems more plausible. Uh, Pinker is going to end up arguing for this strategic view, uh, and Hobbes certainly argued for the strategic view. Uh, and so uh, Pinker's going to give us a couple of different arguments for the uh, uh, this natural selection for for this high, excuse me for the strategic view of violence as opposed to the hydraulic. Okay, so this is this is an argument against the hydraulic theory, uh, and it's a theory. It's an argument that's based on uh, some some of the basic logic of natural selection. Um, and in fact, uh, what Pinker does here is he quotes another very very good book, book called *The Selfish Gene* by a guy named Richard Dawkins. Um, and the quote is as follows. To a survival machine, another survival machine, which is not its own child or another close relative, is part of its environment, like a rock or a river or a lump of food. It is something that gets in the way or something that can be exploited. It differs from a rock or a river in one important respect. It is inclined to hit back. This is because it too is a machine that holds its immortal genes in trust for the future. And it too will stop at nothing to preserve them. Natural selection favors genes that control their survival machines in such a way that they make the best use of their environment. And this includes making the best use of other survival machines, both of the same and of different species. So again, imagine you're designing, like on purpose, you're designing a survival machine, 
If you want this survival machine to be as effective as possible, that is to survive in the, the widest range of circumstances and situations that you can think of, are you going to make it every now and then just sort of build up a violent urge that it somehow has, it has to attack something, right? It, or are you going to make it so that it picks and chooses where it is and isn't violent? I think the answer is probably pretty obvious if you want an effective survival machine. So it seems pretty clear that uh, the, the the logic of natural selection of, of you know these sort of survival machines uh, it, it very much argues against the hydraulic theory of violence and very much in favor of the strategic theory. In fact, when you look at the natural world, you know nature itself. If you've ever seen a nature documentary, uh, in much of the natural world, violence requires no great explanation, right? And the explanation doesn't tend to be, oh, you know. So, for example, when you say, "Why does the lion, you know, sort of rip apart that gazelle?" It's a well, uh, it needs to eat it, <laughs> right? It needs to eat it to live. Uh, it doesn't prey upon the gazelle out of like cruelty or out of some sort of urge you know it's it's like no it's just it's just gotta tear something up that's not how we say that we say well look it has to eat to live right that's the kind of creature it is and so it you know it, it, it's a carnivore it kills what it eats um you know it, it, and, and, you know, when you look at, uh, you know, why are those, you know, two uh, bucks locking horns and banging into each other? It's like, well, they're competing for, for mates, you know, they're, uh, again, they're using it as a kind of strategy to sort of show their prowess or something like that. It's not just, oh, they, they just have these urges, right? Um, and, you know, again, it's, it seems like there's there's reasons. We can, we can you know, uh, we can explain all of this using rational talk about strategies and what is sort of effective for various kinds of organisms in various different kinds of uh, situations. And it also sort of explains why nature does not consist of just one big bloody melee. It's, right? it's not just this constant struggle to survive out there with everything attacking everything. It's not like, you know, Fortnite or something. It's, I mean, it's, we can, t we know why various creatures are violent when they are. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and the why is pretty important. We can explain it uh, again in terms of strategy. It's not just a, you know, sort of a free for all out there. Uh, and of course, uh, some of these reasons are that, like, look, if you, if you had uh, organisms, uh, survival machines that sort of, sort of busted out and were violent every now and then, well, that survival machine might harm another of its close relatives, okay? Uh, you know, if they didn't sort of pick and choose instances of violence, it might, you know, harm the things that are carrying their own genes. That wouldn't be productive. Uh, also, other members of your species are just as well adapted to violence as you are, and so there's a powerful selection pressure against just indiscriminately lashing out. I mean, think about what happens even in sort of modern society to folks who just cannot seem to keep their answers. I mean, there are people with various kinds of disorders that they cannot seem to keep from attacking other people. They cannot, you know, but imagine if such a person just could not help but be violent toward other people, what would we do to that person? Right. Even in our society, like, you know, there are things like, you know, death penalties in some cases if they manage to, to you know, uh, do something severe enough. But at the very least, you're looking at an, an, a lifetime of isolation. Right. There's no reproductive or any other success in that kind of a life. And that's what happens. Right. To uh, uh, organisms that sort of indiscriminately lash out. So, again, it seems like the logic of natural selection seems to indicate that violence should should not just in people be strategic rather than hydraulic. And so that's that's a, one of one of Pinker's arguments here. The other is just to pick up Hobbes. And Hobbes's an analysis of strategic violence goes something like this. And this is again this is a, a, a diagram from from Pinker's book here. This is a um, or we're not the diagram yet. Sorry. Uh, uh, so so this is again just straight out of Hobbes. If you don't remember this part, go straight back to Hobbes. Uh, look at you know the first you know the first page and a half or so, uh, and it's it's uh, right there. So Hobbes points out again that the, there are three incentives for violence. And uh, uh, Pinker here has paraphrased some of the language, made the language a little bit more modern uh, uh, compared to the translation of, of uh, or the, the editing of Hobbes that we have. Uh, the first of these is competition, okay? And th these are the kinds of things that that are the, the sorts of things that would uh, incentivize strategic violence. So the idea is if you can gain a benefit by violence more easily or with less cost than by some other method, well, you'll choose violence. Again, you'll use it strategically. And that's, you know, so competition, uh, just as Hobbes said, is one thing that can incite people to conflict and can make people be violent toward each other. Uh, fear, okay? If you have some reason to suspect that somebody means you harm, that they mean to attack you, take, again, if, they, if you think they want to attack you and take your fruit, well, you might attack them first, okay? Uh, that seems perfectly rational. That's a kind of, again, strategy. And also, uh, there's this notion of uh, what, what 
uh, <clears throat> Pinker calls credibility, right? Uh, uh, Hobbes called it glory or uh, you know honor, depending on on the edition. But uh, credibility is probably the, the the better term for that. Um, and so the idea is that the best way to avoid being attacked is to show a credible threat of retaliation. Uh, and the funny thing about this one is this is the part that often looks like irrational violence, but of course isn't. Um, so I, I, I'm going to ask you to imagine, again, more, more stuff about TV and movies. If you uh, think of like a, a mob movie or a, a movie involving like some great like criminal kingpin or something like that, or, you know, some like a warlord or something like that, right? Um, <clears throat> such a person is, is sort of feared by the people around them. And, and one of the things you learn very early about these kinds of people, you know, this sort of criminal kingpin, is that they're disproportionately violent, right, in certain circumstances. So like, you know, somebody like scuffs their favorite pair of shoes and so they like tear that person's ears off or something like that, right? I mean, that's very disproportionate. That looks like it's just sheer lunacy or sheer, you know, sort of hydraulic violence, right? This, you know, sort of senseless, uh, irrational violence. But is it that senseless or irrational? Right. I mean, if you're if you're in uh, sort of the criminal underworld, right, if you're a mobster, you're, a, you know, a, a criminal kingpin and somebody threatens your interests, you know, like uh, uh, what, what are you going to do? Call the cops. <laughs> right. I mean, are you going to look the Leviathan's not available to you? You're in your own little miniature state of nature in that case. And so the idea is in your own little state of nature, you can only be as safe as, as you can convince, you know, as, as you can get by your own by your own efforts. And so if you are the kind of person, right, you convince everybody around you that you'll react disproportionately violently to the smallest of perceived slights, how is everybody else going to act around you, right? They're going to be really, really, really careful. And that's that's the whole uh, logic of, of the behavior there. And so this notion of, of maintaining credibility, sometimes that looks like very irrational violence, but it isn't. It's, again, part of a strategy. Whether people realize that they're being strategic or not is another thing, but it, it is a strategy. So Hobbes here uh, brings in, uh, or excuse me, Pinker brings in this uh, diagram to talk about Hobbes, right? It's this thing called the violence triangle. Because in every violent incident, there are sort of three parties that are concerned in some way. There's uh, the aggressor, that is, you know, the one who is trying to get something from the victim by means of violence, right? That's uh, that's the, the violence from aggressor to victim is called predation, okay? The victim is interested in the sense that they want to retaliate against the aggressor, right? That's, a, 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 you know, again, we call that retaliation. And the bystander is concerned to try and uh, limit uh, collateral damage. So let's keep track of the motives of each of these different parties to a violent act. Again, the aggressor's motive is to prey upon the victim. The victim's motive here is to retaliate upon the aggressor. And the bystander's motive is to limit the collateral damage, right? They want to uh, prevent as much uh, sort of, you know, bad stuff as, as possible here, right? Uh, so Hobbes's argument, and, and it's the argument that uh, uh, Pinker here is, is advocating, is uh, this notion that, of course, peace is better than violence. But if you're going to pick and choose, if the idea is you can either have this predation retaliation cycle between aggressors and victims, or you can have a, a bystander in the, in, the, in the guise of law sort of uh, put an end to it, uh, Hobbes's argument here is, is that law is better than war, okay? That uh, the violence of, of the Leviathan against victims and aggressors to prevent them from harming each other and, and uh, other people outside of this uh, dispute is better than this sort of cycle of predation retaliation that, that you get without the Leviathan, right? That's, that's essentially Hobbes's argument. And again, we see that Hobbes's uh, uh, argument here, uh, Hobbes's idea about the relationship between the Leviathan and violence uh, creates a testable prediction. If governments really do reduce interpersonal violence, then we ought to see a significant drop in rates of violence coinciding with the appearance of the first real governments, and then should see a marked reduction over time as governments grow very much larger and more powerful, because they absolutely have. Now, Hobbes, of course, did not have the kind of data required to make, um, uh, uh, to really test his prediction here, uh, but we absolutely do today. And so let's take a look at some of that data. Before we get to looking at the data itself, we need to answer a few questions about uh, how to interpret the data and, of course, what kind of data we really have and where it comes from. <clears throat> 
And so this is an important point. Anytime you're interpreting data, you have to consider whether you want to look at numbers themselves, like absolute numbers, how many of this, how many of that, what we call absolute numbers, or whether you want to look at relative numbers or rates or percentages or things like that. And so when we're looking at violence, it doesn't really make all that much sense to look at absolute numbers, okay? Um, because it would mislead us, okay? So it is true that there are way more deaths from violence now than there were in prehistoric times. That's just true. But that's mostly because there are way more people now, okay? If we were only looking at absolute numbers, we'd be making a mistake. Uh, it would be like arguing that cars were safer in the 1930s than they are now because there were a smaller number of auto-related fatalities in the 1930s than there are now. Yes, it's true that there were fewer auto-related fatalities in the 1930s, but that's because there just are way more cars now, okay? So that's, that's certainly something to keep in mind. We're not gonna be looking at absolute numbers because that's misleading. We're instead going to be looking at relative numbers, that is, rates of violence, okay, uh, not totals. So in other words, what we're doing is we're basically saying, what are the chances that you would die violently if you were one of the people living in some various different times and places, right? So we're going to say, you know, what, what, are, what are the odds, okay? And if the odds are higher, that's a more violent place. If the odds are lower, that's a less violent place. So that's how we're going to uh, interpret the data. Those are the, the kinds of numbers we're going to be looking for, uh, rates. And of course, we have uh, data from a couple of different sources. We have source, we have uh, information from what we, from ethnographers, okay, uh, and we have uh, information from archaeologists, okay. Uh, ethnographers uh, are people who study uh, tribal groups, right? Uh, groups of people who live uh, without sort of modern governments, who uh, live in a kind of tribal or, or, or a, you know. A, um, a smaller social structure that's not sort of under, you know, something that you'd call a leviathan. Uh, there are such people who live today uh, uh, in, in very remote parts of the world, like in the middle of, you know, the rainforest, for example. Um, and there are also a number of those people who have lived in the more or less recent past, right, where we have uh, good records of people who have studied uh, how those people have, uh, how those people lived their lives. We also have archaeological data. This is data from the, 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 the more distant past, okay? And this is data from human remains and, you know, other sort of things that we sort of dig up or find, uh, you know, from, from artifacts, right? Um, and we can estimate, for example, the rates of violent death in past societies, especially long past societies, by looking for signs of violence on the remains, right, on the bones, and figuring out what proportion of remains died of natural causes as opposed to violent causes. Right. So if anything, uh, this will underestimate our historical rates of violence because uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, but, uh, you know, the biggest ones being that if the act of violence didn't leave a mark on the bones, we can't really detect it. Right. So if somebody was like strangled or drowned, uh, it's not going to leave any mark on the bones. And so we wouldn't know that. Right. Um, or, or if they you know, had a, a gut wound or something that they, they died of sepsis, I, not going to leave a mark on the bones. Uh, and so we, we just wouldn't know. Uh, those who die of natural causes are also uh, buried more often in burial sites, and so they're easier to find, right? So sometimes, you know, murder victims are, are hidden, right? They're, they're, they're dumped away where people won't find them, and we, in some cases, haven't found them. So, um, so in any case, uh, using the archaeological data might underestimate the historical rates of violence, and so that's something to keep in mind. As it turns out, it, it won't really uh, matter for our purposes. Okay, so let's first uh, uh, look at group violence, that is uh, violence between groups of people. That's another, uh, we can talk about that, uh, we'll call that war. When we talk about war in this context, we're going to talk about, uh, we're, we're, we're meaning group violence, that is some organized violence between one group and, uh, and another. Okay. Uh, and so the reason that we want to take a look at this especially and look at this first is that it's often assumed that it's, of course, governments that go to war, and that's that's true, right? Um, that governments do go to war, uh, but uh, but the idea is that the assumption is that the larger the government, the more destructive the wars, and so you get an argument from people who think that, say, for example, like anarchy is a good thing because they say, well, gosh, look at you know the bigger the government, the bigger the war, you know, look at all the giant world wars of the 20th century and all the genocides, and you know, look at all the bad stuff that state violence does, right? Because uh, because it's states, it's governments that are responsible for group violence, and it's group violence that is really big, right? So notice this is the argument against Hobbes. This is the war 
uh, is better than law argument, right? That, you know, if, if you just sort of left people alone, you'd have, you know, smaller numbers of people killing people instead of these sort of giant operations of killing or something mm -hmm. like that. Well, let's see if that, uh, if that bears out in the, the data itself. Let's see if the anarchists get what they think they want. So here's a figure, of course, from uh, the book itself. Uh, and again, these are, uh, you see the, the label on this is percentage of, of deaths in warfare. So this is a kind of rate. This is what percentage of the total deaths that we can find are, are uh, sort of from, you know, as far as we can tell, uh, some recognizable, you know, violence, right? So death in warfare. Um, and you see that you, you, a bunch of uh, prehistoric uh, archaeological sites, you can see that uh, up in sort of this top uh, section of the graph here. Um, and then you can see uh, that, that here we have uh, the average of all of those sites, right? Um, and uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, and again, this is this is archaeological data. Uh, here, uh, this uh, and uh, you know, or I guess I should make that, that bit and this bit here. Uh, these are from ethnologists, right? These are people who study uh, uh, people who live without leviathans, people who live in tribal structures um, in the uh, in the recent past or even in the present. Uh, and again, we got you know, you got sort of the, the they're grouped, and you can see the uh, the average bars uh, sort of uh, on the bottom here. Now, at the bottom of this graph, you see. Uh, uh, states, right? That is people, uh, states in the sense of, you know, modern governments, that is governments that are leviathans, right? That's uh, the idea that have sort of organized in such a way as to appoint the central authority that's supposed to have a monopoly on violence. And if you look at the, at the, the, the top bar here, the, the largest bar, uh, you can see that uh, it, it, it's it's much smaller, number one, than all of these these other bars. Uh, but also, see, this is ancient Mexico before 1500. So this is uh, what you might call like the Aztec Empire, which if you know anything about the Aztec Empire, they these were people who like captured slaves in warfare and then ritually sacrificed at least some of them, right? This is a society that practices human sacrifice, okay? Uh, surely such a society will be far more violent than these peaceful tribes, right? Well, as it turns out, no. As it turns out, the societies under the Leviathan are not just uh, more peaceful than these uh, non-Leviathan societies. They're much more peaceful uh, than these uh, non-Leviathan uh, societies. In fact, if you look at the, the, the selection down here, we have the world uh, in the 20th century, okay, is, is, is uh, the next bar down. Europe between uh, 1900 and 1960, okay, so that's mostly just a couple of world wars in there. So we, we've, we've cherry picked it a little bit um, and, you know, and a genocide thrown in there as well. Uh, uh, Europe in the 17th century, that's Hobbes's day, remember? that uh, 30 years war that was uh, among the most destructive periods in human history. Uh, you can see uh, Europe and the United States in the 20th century. Again, if you're going to sort of cherry pick things, uh, remember that the war itself never really came to U.S. soil. And so that, that, that drops the bar from just sort of Europe 1900 and 1960 uh, or, or the world in the 20th century. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, sort of, uh, uh, the, you know, in terms of just battle deaths, you're talking about a, a rather small proportion of, of group violence there. And then if, if you look down here where you can barely see any bars at all, right, um, that's that's uh, the U.S. and the world in 2005 in terms of battle or war deaths. And now it's not like nothing was going on. Uh, there was there were there were in the, in the United States alone was involved in two wars, uh, a war in, in Iraq and a war in Afghanistan at the time. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not that there just weren't any wars that year. Um, it's the, the, the amount of deaths from those wars just totally dwarfs all of these other sources. And so uh, if we're gonna draw a nice little line here, okay? And so you can sort of look at the data, right? Look at the violence compared. So again, if we if we just cherry pick the absolute worst bits of the 20th century, just the worst years, just the years in which there were giant wars and genocides, uh, that's what you get. You get this sort of blue line. Like compare where all of these things are, right? Like these bars here and here and here. Compare, look at, look at where they are compared to that blue line. Way higher. Uh, we could compare uh, Hobbes's Europe, right, to those those lines. And again, you see, it's it's pretty it's pretty clear. Um, that little circle down at the bottom there is like you know I'll draw a little red circle around the red circle. Why not? Um, that's again that's the world into the. It, you don't even see a bar, okay. And the world in 2005 contained mostly very large, very strong governments, a lot of leviathans, right? So the world was, in terms of group violence, quite safe compared to other possible ways of living.
So again, if you take the the averages of all of those things, the average of uh, prehistoric pre-state peoples, um, you know, and, and remember this is from 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 the archaeological data, uh, and these things are from uh, ethnography data, and so you can get uh, an average of uh, uh, hunter gatherers or uh, uh, hunter horticulturalists, and again, it's it's just not even close. Uh, that's the average again from cherry picking the absolute worst stretches of the 20th century. And so if you're going to try and make a case that state violence is so much worse than if we didn't have a Leviathan, uh, the historical data does not hold up that argument in, in any way, shape or form. The, the data is very, very clear. And in fact, uh, if you look uh, very recently, such as in 2005, uh, you're looking at the total percentage of, of, of deaths in warfare is 0.03% is right, of the world's population. It's, it's, it's very, very low, much lower than in a non-state society or in a state in a society that has sort of weaker, less well-organized leviathans. And so, when we talk about uh, this sort of group violence, uh, you know, in, in the case of modern governments, we mean wars, right? In in a, in a pretty recognizable way. But if you're talking about uh, uh, people who live in tribal structures who don't live in in under leviathans, that is non-state peoples, warfare generally takes two forms, and that's sort of what we mean here. Uh, we mean things like raids, okay? Uh, that is uh, organized, right? Uh, groups of people who go out and and try and take by violence resources or territory. And of course, that's going to include counter raids. So somebody raids you and takes your stuff. What do you do? Well, you get some group of people and you raid them back, right? Take your stuff back and take some of their stuff, right? So they don't even think about raiding you again, okay? Um, or reprisals, right? Say somebody, you know, has, has a bar fight and kills your cousin, right? Well, what are you going to do? You're going to get a bunch of your family band together and go kill one of their family, right? Or kill the guy that did the killing, right? So that's a kind of organized revenge killing. It's, it's group violence. And uh, that group violence will include organized uh, sort of uh, revenge, revenge killings. And of course, revenge, revenge, revenge killings. And I think you can see why rates of violence in non-state peoples end up uh, where they end up. And so we've looked at group violence, okay? And now uh, we're gonna look at sort of interpersonal violence. That is violence between, uh, more or less between individuals, okay? So uh, we think like murders and, and that sort of thing. When we look at murder rates, um, uh, the standard way of, of representing a murder rate is uh, by the number of people murdered per 100,000 people who are alive per year, okay? And so that, that rate per 100,000 per year, uh, yeah, it's a very standard measure. But it can be really hard to wrap your head around what it means. So say somebody said, hey, the murder rate right around here is 80 per 100,000 per year. Like, you're like, okay, is that, is, that, is that good? Is that bad? How high is that? Right? So again, I want to try and give some of these numbers a little bit of context. And so uh, to start off, assume that you have 100 friends, relatives, and acquaintances. That is, people whose name that you know when you meet them, right? And you would be able to tell somebody else at least something about them. Say, oh, that's this person. Here's something true about them, right? I mean, and honestly, you probably do have roughly 100 people who fit that description, right? Uh, and so, again, just assume for these purposes, you know, there's 100 people that you, you know, right? You know well enough to know at least something about them including like, you know, their names and, and other things, right? Friends, relatives, acquaintances. So if the murder rate where you live is 50 per 100,000 per year, that means that you ought to know at least one murder victim, that one of your 100, right, will be murdered on average once every 20 years, right? And so if you're, say, 40 years old, you should probably know two murder victims, right, on average, if the murder rate around you is about 50 per 100,000 per year. And so usually in, in a classroom environment, you can ask people, you sort of raise their hands, and it's not a representative sample. It tends to skew young in a college classroom. Um, and, uh, you know, and it's a place, you know, it's in one place at one time, and it's not a big sample. But in general, uh, if you ask how many people actually know somebody, right, know somebody that would be in this top hundred of people you know the best, um, you know, how many of you know one of, have one of those, know a murder victim in that sense, right, know one that well. And in a group full of 20 year olds, statistically you'd kind of expect, again, not a lot of five year olds are getting murdered, so that's, that, that skews it a little bit if it skews young, but still you'd expect on average, everybody who's lived for 20 years to have known one person in the last 20 years who had been murdered, right? Um, and, and that's certainly not the case. Not everybody raises their hands. And so what that tells you is that around you, the murder rate is probably less than 50 per 100,000 per year. But if you're in a room where you say, how many of you know a murder victim, and everybody raises their hand, uh, you can bet that the murder rate probably is 50 or higher, right? That's, you know, that's, uh, again, 
based on sample size, et cetera, and, and you know, other things. So if we double that, if the murder rate were 100 per 100,000 per year, uh, you would know one murder victim on average every decade. Okay, that's, that's actually a lot. And so one of the things that is a little bit misleading about some of these uh, figures, about these murder rates, is that some of these relatively low numbers are actually quite high, right? You think 100 per 100,000 per year, that doesn't sound very high. That's actually quite high. You very rarely see murder rates at that level sustained for any, any real length of time, uh, certainly in the modern world. Uh, so that, that's pretty unusual. And if we really take it off, right, if the murder rate is at 1,000 per 100,000 per year, that means you will know a murder victim out of your out of your 100 friends, relatives, and acquaintances. One of them will be murdered every year, right? And and you'll have a better than even chance of being murdered yourself, right? So flip a coin. If it's tails, you're going to be murdered at some point if the murder rate is that high. Um, and that's um, that's that. Like I said, that's that's almost. That's almost unheard of uh, to have uh, murder rates that are that high. So again, I wanted to give you a little bit of context on what those numbers really mean, uh, what seems to be real good or what seems to be real bad. And we'll sort of check in on some specific locations uh, for that purpose a little bit a little bit later. So here's another figure from Pinker's book. Um, and again, these are based on lots and lots and lots of data, right? We have those pretty good data about most of this stuff. Uh, uh, this particular figure, uh, again, uh, lays out right a, a lot of different people and sort of lays out sort of deaths in, in a sort of per 100,000 people per year. right? Remember when I said that uh, anything like 1,000 or above is, is really incredible uh, and, and it's, it's very rare historically. Like these are, these are some uh, sort of uh, uh, you know, interesting examples. And I want to draw your attention to one in particular. I want to draw your attention to the one over at the far left here. This is Cato, California in the 1840s. And to look at how, how high that murder rate is, uh, it's, that's incredible, right? I mean, that's again, uh, you would be very much more likely to be murdered than not to be murdered if you lived in, in Cato, California in the 1840s. Now, I want you to think to yourself, right, what's going on in California in the 1840s, right? And if nothing comes to mind, start thinking about football teams. That gives you a clue, okay? Right? Think about the 49ers, right? Why do they call them 49ers? Well, because of all the people that came in, especially, at the, I think it peaked in about 1849, uh, that's the gold rush, right? So, Again, California is not yet a state at this point, right? There's no real state government. Uh, there's a lot of these towns that sort of pop up, these sort of mining towns. They don't have, you know, sort of law and order. There's no real civilization out there. There's just a bunch of mostly young men uh, going out into the wilderness to literally dig money out of the ground, okay? And so you got these people making their little pile of rocks that are super valuable, uh, and there's no law and order. Uh, and they're all, it, it, it's as close to a state of nature as you could possibly have. And what happens, right? Looks like Hobbes was dead right, right? No, no pun intended here, but he was, he was completely correct uh, that uh, you're going to end up with a, just an extreme, just unbelievable level of violence in those kinds of situations, right? Where there's just absolutely no Leviathan at all uh, and every reason to sort of, you know, distrust people, uh, you know, they're going to, they're going to take your gold or something like that. I mean, that's, it's just a, it's a, it's a nightmare scenario. And so it, again, given Hobbes' analysis, it shouldn't be surprising, but of course Hobbes' analysis is, you know, absolutely predicts that sort of thing. But again, you take this whole bit and you say, here we go. Here's, here's our, you know, our average of, you know, 27 of these non-state societies. Uh, and again, compare that to our, our Leviathans, right? This section over here uh, where, you know, again, even, even a civilization that practices human sacrifices is, is you know, only, only it's, it's half as dangerous as uh, this sampling of non-state societies. And even when we cherry pick the, the very worst parts of the 20th century, I mean, Russia lost, you know, like twice as much as everybody else lost in terms of people in World War II. Uh, and, and, you know, World War I wasn't a whole lot better for them. Uh, I mean, it was it was really awful. And again, even if we cherry pick that, it's still safer uh, than the sampling of non-Leviathan uh, organizations. So that, again, that gives the lie to this idea that um, <clears throat> bigger governments just mean more violence or more state violence. It, it, it turns out, again, the, the data is uh, very much against that view.
And so if we want to compare, right, so sort of, you know, murder rates in the, in the contemporary world, again, just to get a sense of, uh, you know, context in terms of what these numbers really mean, but also to start really trying to predict uh, the effect of Leviathans, the effect of, like, you know, effective governments, effective police forces on the rates of violence, the rates of interpersonal violence, uh, let's take a look. OK, and I think most people know that St. Louis is the murder capital of the United States. And so I think it's, it's worth uh, saying how, what's bad. Right. We say that St. Louis is pretty bad in terms of its murder rate. What what is what actually counts as bad? And what I encourage you to do is like jot down a guess. Right. Based on, um, you know, based on what uh, we've seen uh, earlier, what I what we talked about in terms of, um, you know, what it means to have a murder rate of a certain of a certain number per hundred thousand per year. Well, it turns out that in 2018, anyway, these are the, the best figures I could uh, I could find. Uh, it usually takes a little while to sort of crunch this data. So, the, you know, it's always a couple of years behind reality. Uh, but in 2018, St. Louis's murder rate was 61 per 100,000 per year, right? So is that higher or lower than you'd guessed, right? So if you'd, if you'd guessed high, higher than that, uh, well, look, it's, you know, it, it's bad, right? But, but that's the top end. Right for uh, for the United States certainly right that's that, that's pretty bad. Detroit for a long time used to be America's most dangerous city. Um, actually, once upon a time, Detroit was America's wealthiest city. Uh, if 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 that isn't sort of a strange factoid, but it's true. Um, but Detroit for a long time was America's most dangerous city. These days, it's gotten much much better. Um, and and so, but it, it's still you know a, it's still a, a fairly dangerous place. It still I think is in the top five if I think if I if I remember right in terms of U.S. cities. Uh, and it's all the way down at uh, it's a, a 39 per hundred thousand per year. Okay, it's certainly not good, uh, but not nearly. It's not as bad as that 61. Okay. Uh, but now think of something like New York City, which is, of course, much bigger than than D Detroit or St. Louis. It might, in fact, be bigger than Detroit and St. Louis put together. I haven't really looked, um, but 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 certainly bigger than either of those two places. Um, and it's not just city size, right? So think think to yourself, right? Does does uh, New York City uh, does New York City's police force, right, as compared with St. Louis's police force, for example, have a really good reputation or a really bad reputation? Right? Do people say, oh, NYPD, those bunch of screw ups? Or do they think, well, NYPD is one of the best police forces in the country? Right. Like, imagine that you're, you're you know, if you know any uh, police, ask them. Right. And and chances are they may have like had trainings. Right. Or or, you know, they've brought in people from the NYPD to you know, act as sort of models of good police work. It's a very, very effective police force. Uh, and I think that's reflected in New York City's uh, murder rate, which is three point four. Okay. In fact, New York City is actually safer as a, 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 than than the country as a whole. Uh, it's a it's pretty unusual for a large city uh, to have that uh, that sort of a feature. But again, really effective policing uh, seems to make a difference in terms of uh, interpersonal violence. Contrast that with uh, Caracas. Uh, Caracas is a city in Venezuela. And again, if you don't know a whole lot, think about what you do know. Uh, does Venezuela have like a really great sort of put together, you know, government that's got it all figured out with a really nice, great police force? Or is it uh, not so much uh, that horribly well organized? Well, it's, it's actually not that horribly well organized. And so what would you expect, high or low? Again, write down a guess or say a guess out loud, right? You have something to check yourself against. Turns out uh, the murder rate in Caracas is 100 per 100,000 per year, right? Much uh, very much worse than 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 St. Louis, right? Uh, Tijuana again. Think uh, Mexican police. Uh, good reputation, bad reputation. So then that should inform whether you're guessing high or low. And again, write down, say out a guess. 138. That's the most dangerous city in the world uh, in 2018. Um, it's uh, it's pretty bad. Uh, and again, uh, it, you could predict that sort of thing if you think, well, gosh, you know, based on what I know about Mexican police, uh, they don't have a very good reputation, and for very good reason. Uh, so you might guess very, very high. And again, Tijuana is the the, the most dangerous city in the con in uh, in the world uh, as of 2018, where where I got these numbers. Uh, Tokyo, though, consider Tokyo has like, you know, like, I think like 13 million people or something like that. Uh, way bigger that it's the biggest city on this list by I think by a long way. Um, and so again, city size doesn't matter as much. Does Japan have a, a sort of, you know, what do, what do you know about Japanese police, Japanese law enforcement, the Japanese government in general? Is it very highly organized, very well put together, very much about the rules uh, or not so much? Well, if you don't know anything about it, you won't be able to answer that question. But if you do know something about Tokyo, you know, they really do take the rules pretty seriously there. And they do have a very well established, uh, very stable government that's very well organized. And so, again, you should guess low. How low are you going to guess? Probably not low enough. Tokyo's murder rate is 0.3 per 100,000 per year. It's one of the safest places in the world.
Now, of course, in the United States, uh, in the 70s and 80s, there was a bit of a crime wave. Uh, you know, the crime sort of took off, especially, you know, the, the, the murder rate, you know, went up and up and up and up, and it went up rather quickly. And so sometimes you'll have, you, you had people getting really scared of this. And so I, I'd encourage you to Google the term uh, super predator, right? Uh, because th this is a whole thing that went on all the way through the 90s. I remember it very well. I was sort of growing up in that period. And uh, people were really scared. They, they saw these you know, sort of crime rates that had been increasing through the 70s and accelerating through the 80s. And then in the early 90s, you know, and up into the mid 90s, people were like, oh God, what's our society gonna be like in a few years? We'll be overrun by like vicious, vicious criminals. And in fact, it, it sort of bled over into some of the fiction, some of the movies that were made at the time. Uh, one example is, uh, uh, is Escape from New York, right? Which is a stars Kurt Russell. It's a very cheesy film. Came out in I think 1981, um, and you know, it's again, it's worth it's worth a watch. It's it's a it's a little cheesy, but it's you know, it is what it is. And part of the premise of the movie is that in the future they've had to basically just turn the whole city of New York into a prison. They just put a big wall up into it and just they just dump criminals in there. It's kind of a free for all, right? Uh, because society is just so overrun with crime. And so what they do is they took existing trends and they just extrapolate them into the future. In fact, Escape from New York, I think, is supposed to be set in like 1997. Um, you know, and, and, and again, just if you can, if you can remember what actual 1997 was like, or, you know, ask somebody who can, um, it wasn't, we did not have to put walls around New York City and turn it into a prison by that point. Um, in fact, uh, New York City was, was much safer than it was in 1987. Uh, so uh, uh, the idea is that uh, the Air Force One, like you know, uh, has a problem, and and you know that the president of the United States is is sort of in New York, and so they have to send in this guy like Kurt Russell with an eye patch, you know, to like because he's he's a you know a bad a bad mofo, and he's gonna go and get the president out of New York. That's that's the movie. Um, <clears throat> don't want to spoil too much for you. And of course, uh, films like Demolition Man. This is one of my very favorites. Um, uh, sort of an oddly prescient. I think it's, uh, you look at some of its ideas about future society, it's, uh, again, if you just see it, you'll, you'll, you'll see what I mean. I don't want to give away anything. Uh, but the idea is that uh, at the beginning of this movie, it shows like like Los Angeles in I think like 1996 or something, uh, which is only like three years after the movie was released. It was released in 93, if I remember right. Uh, and Again, it depicts the 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 the, the mid '90s, the late '90s, as this uh, you know place where there are just all these like super criminals out there. You know, uh, like I said, these super predators was the term they often used to sort of describe this scary thing that they thought was going to take over our society. Uh, and Wesley Snipes plays just one such you know sort of super criminal. And uh, you know uh, Stallone plays this cop that like takes him down, like you know with with uh, with uh, extreme prejudice, right? You know, like uh, you know it, it it's an action film, uh, but it's it's kind of got a, a funny edge to it. It doesn't entirely take itself uh, too seriously, which is always a good thing in a film. Um, and so in any case, uh, both of these films sort of had this idea that, that, that crime was going to just completely take over society and make make the whole of the United States unfit to live in before too very long. Um, now, as it turns out, it didn't happen. The crime rave, uh, it, it just it plateaued and, and then it dropped off um, and uh, continued to sort of historic lows after that point. Um, but uh, the worst it got, what would you think? How high would it have to get nationwide for people to start really panicking and making movies like this? Right? Say a guess, write something down. You probably guess too high. It's just 10. It, it got to 10. That's bad. I mean, that's very bad, right? That's among the worst countries in the world these days, right? Um, but, um, but it, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's not that bad. Murder rates uh, are, are sort of funny. <clears throat> they're always lower for whole countries than they are for certain parts of those countries, right? So they're always higher in cities than they are sort of just in the countryside. Again, you know, part of that's just more people. Um, but uh, when you zoom in on cities, you'll notice that the murder rates are higher in some parts of cities than others, right? Some parts of cities are safer than the country as a whole, and other parts are much more dangerous. And then you zoom in on the parts of cities that, uh, that tend to have the highest rates of murders and other violence, uh, and uh, some some neighborhoods, some parts of neighborhoods are actually much more dangerous than other parts of the same neighborhoods. And I think you can you, you, you'll see that that's you know if you've had any experience in, in, in a city at all, you'll know that that's that's true. And so it's a little bit funny. So if we want to get to the other side of our, our uh, thing here, we're going to sort of buzz through this a bit. 
Uh, Kansas City's uh, murder rate is, uh, at, at last I could find, about 28 per 100,000 per year. It's about average for a city of its size. It's a little high. I think part of the reason for that is that it straddles a state line, and I think it's always more difficult for police forces to coordinate across a state line. You see that in St. Louis and with East St. Louis. Uh, you see it in uh, Chicago with Gary, Indiana, um, et cetera, right? Um, I mean, those are just some, some examples of where sort of metro areas sprawl across state lines. And sometimes I think that makes uh, a law enforcement a little bit harder to coordinate. Again, the U.S. as a whole is much safer than any particular city in, you know, uh, in it generally. Uh, the, the murder rate in the U.S. as a whole is about five. Okay, what would you assume it is in Canada, our neighbors to the north? All right. If you'd guessed low, you're correct. It's 1.8. Uh, Canada is roughly on par with most other Western countries, uh, um, you know, sort of you know, modernized, rich countries. Uh, most of Western Europe is between one and two. Um, <clears throat> uh, if you want to say Ghana, okay, Ghana is a, a country in Africa, and most of these numbers are from 2017 because I just couldn't get anything a lot more recent. Um, so uh, again, uh, say out a guess, right? And uh, again, your assumptions may prove incorrect. Ghana has a murder rate of 2.1 per 100,000 per year. Um, uh, much safer in the United States. Uh, the United States sometimes is criticized for its uh, murder rate. It's it's much higher, not only than a lot of rich countries, but it's higher than a lot of much poorer countries as well. Um, and uh, so again, Argentina, right? Think, okay, South America. South America as, as a whole has a higher murder rate than North America. Um, but Argentina, again, has, you know, it's it's not that bad. It's, it's roughly the same as the United States, right? Which again is um, not great for the U.S. It's not a great comparison. Uh, El Salvador um, is the most uh, dangerous country in the world at uh, 61.8. And uh, part of the story there is that there's a widespread sort of gang warfare. Uh, the police are, in some cases, just viewed as a, another rival gang. Uh, the government itself doesn't really control the whole country. And so, again, very weak leviathan, very high rate of violence. Um, and in fact, there's progress. A couple of years ago, this was way up well over 100. And so things have gotten better, but they're still bad. And I feel for the, you know, the vast majority of the people there are just, it's just ordinary people just trying to get by. And I, uh, you feel for those, those folks who just, you know, want to live a normal life. Um, Saudi Arabia, right? You know, I think, oh, the Middle East, that's a violent place. Eh, not, not necessarily. I mean, yeah, Syria is pretty violent right now, but, um, you know, Saudi Arabia is a very well-ordered society with a very strong centralized government, uh, you know, quite the Leviathan there. Um, th yeah, I mean, that they're, they're at the same levels as most of the rest of Western Europe. Again, most of the, you know, sort of civilized world, uh, with the exception of the United States. The world's murder rate is, uh, is uh, about 6.1 uh, uh, overall in 2017. So uh, a little bit higher than it is in the United States, but I think the United States is closer to the middle of the pack uh, in terms of that than, than I think most people would like it to be. And here uh, we have uh, Pinker being a little bit playful. Um, so he includes this figure, uh, and this figure, again, is a comparison between sort of state peoples and non-state peoples. And we've cherry-picked the absolute worst we can find in terms of people who live under leviathans. Um, and what's funny about the, 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 the non-state people to the left, right, the, these, these four specific groups, is that they're all groups that have had books written about how peaceful they are. Okay, and then, of course, when we look at the comparison, it, it's... It's not even close, right? So again, that's that's Pinker being a little bit playful. We can look at uh, sort of deep history. We can look at much. You know, we can look at trends over time. Uh, these are historical murder rates in England, the Netherlands, and Belgium, Scandinavia, Germany, Switzerland, and Italy. Okay, so uh, European nations, and you see how uh, they start on the left in the year roughly 1300, and what the trend is as you go all the way uh, into more or less the present. And you see not only is it a decrease. It's a remarkable decrease. And so again, Hobbes looks like he was dead on. Not only does he predict that violence should, should be decreasing as Leviathans are getting better and bigger and more well organized, but it should be decreasing a lot, right? We ought to be living in the most peaceable time in human history based on how well uh, organized our governments are, how powerful our governments are compared to the way they used to be. And we are. We are, in fact, living in the most peaceable time in human history. And it's not even close. Okay. And in fact, you can see some interesting things here. So if you look at this uh, little light blue line that's on the top here, uh, this is this is Italy's line, and we see this big bump here, right? And and so actually, uh, the country of Italy went through a major upheaval. Like its government was very very ineffective, uh, you know, through the through the 19th century, you know, between 1800 and 1900. And in fact, there was a, a rise of organizations in 
when you know with with the lack of of a leviathan with the lack of the government keeping the peace what it fell to was a lot of essentially family organizations you know that would try and keep the peace in their own little towns their own little places and of course the italians especially in sicily had a name for such organizations they called them the mafia okay and so you know, again we see what sort of you know uh, what what happens when sort of you know the the, the mafia is in your, your leviathan instead of like an actual real government like a real leviathan and uh, you know yeah things go in the wrong direction for a little while uh, before settling down and, and having you know a real government sort of take over and assert order again and so uh, lastly uh, we should we should pay attention to this other part of Hobbes's prediction that is testable um, we should pay attention to the sort of, uh, you know, we should say, look, in places where the Leviathan isn't present or isn't available, we should see an uptick in violence, okay? And so we should look at the motives and circumstances of violence to see if it tallies with Hobbes' analysis. And if you look at this particular category, this is from uh, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, uh, they say this, they say many of the homicides involve sort of drugs or drug trafficking, including the following, that is drug manufacture, dispute over drugs, theft of drugs or drug money, a drug scam, a bad drug deal, punishment for drug theft, or illegal use of drugs. One of these circumstances was involved for 18% of defendants and 16% of victims, right? When you put that sort of you know, together, that's like, you know, like something like one out of five-ish, ish, right? Um, and so the idea is that again, imagine somebody steals your drugs, right? So you're you're, you're engaged in, in in you know illegal activity. Somebody steals your drugs. What are you going to do? Call the cops, <laughs> right? Of course not, right? You're engaged in a criminal enterprise. And so if you're engaging in a criminal enterprise, you're putting yourself in some sense in a situation where the Leviathan doesn't you know where the Leviathan's not an option to protect you anymore, right? You know uh, at the risk of you know, you're going to turn yourself in in, the, in this sense, right? Um, and so in such circumstances, whenever people are engaged in illegal activities, because they're in an activity where, you know, the Leviathan isn't really an option to protect them, they have to protect themselves. And so again, you end up with these little mini state, states of nature. And so if you're engaged in illegal activity, all of a sudden, your odds of, of uh, being the victim of or perpetrator of violence went go way, way, way up. Right. And again, that's exactly what Hobbes would have predicted uh, just based on, uh, on the simple rationality of the situation. Again, uh, we're picking on you know drugs here. It's, it's one kind of illegal activity. Other illegal activities have similar associations because the parties in an illegal activity can't call the Leviathan to resolve their disputes. And so, you know, so so when we look at all the data, when we look at like the the real world the way it really is, it looks like um, it looks like Hobbes really got it right. Right, that the the stronger, more well organized leviathans, that is organizations that take a monopoly on violence, tend to uh, preside over societies that are very, very, very much more peaceful uh, than others. And if we have some interest in diminishing violence and, and continuing to diminish violence in human affairs, uh, we have to take this lesson seriously uh, and think about what the role of the government is, what the ro role of the leviathan is in ensuring that kind of peace and thus hopefully prosperity. So uh, I, I like to append this little coda onto the end of this, right? So one of the things that people sometimes do is they, they sometimes worry about, you know, being murdered, right? You know, they, they'll, they'll actually change their behavior to avoid, you know, uh, sort of being murdered. And in most cases, this is, this is a bit irrational. I think people, because Whenever you see murders happen, they, they get reported on the news, right? And that gives people the impression that they're really more common than they are compared to other uh, causes of death. And I, I, I wanna bring some of that back to earth. So according to the World Health Organization, here are the top causes of death globally around the world. Uh, number one, heart disease, right? At a rate of 126 per 100,000 per year, right? Can't live without a heart. And if your heart goes out, that's, that's bad. Um, and so you probably, you might not have thought that was the top one, but if you think to yourself, okay, well, yeah. If you start thinking in this way, it's like, okay, I absolutely need my heart to be working to live. What else do I need to be working to live? You're probably gonna get the, the next most common causes of death here. Um, so stroke, okay, that, that's uh, something that affects uh, your, your brain, okay? Uh, it's usually brain damage that ends up causing the, the death in a stroke. Uh, so you can't live without your brain. Uh, that's, that's why it's, uh, you know, uh, it's up there. Uh, COPD, uh, it's a chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, so it's uh, some of the, the lungs, essentially. You need your lungs as well. Uh, COPD, uh, very often a result of smoking uh, or other sorts of uh, environmental issues there. Uh, 
lower respiratory infections, okay? Uh, that's, that's a whole number of things, uh, but that's a uh, 40 per 100,000 per year. It comes in at number four. Notice how, how steeply uh, the numbers are going down. We started at 126, then we go to about half that, and then to a little over half that again by the time we're down to number three, okay? Uh, Alzheimer's or dementia, again, another, you know, sort of like two thirds of, of, you know, of the previous number, I guess, well, three fourths of the previous number, really. Yeah, maybe closer to two thirds. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, Alzheimer's, dementia, again, uh, you can't live without, without your brain. And if it, when it, when it, when it goes, it goes, right? That's uh, certainly threatening. Uh, lung cancers, right? Another lung issue, another vital organ. Uh, that's uh, 23 per 100,000 per year. And thankfully that's decreasing as people sort of smoke less uh, globally. Um, diabetes, right, is a, is a growing problem, actually. It's a 21 per 100,000 per year. Uh, road injury is at 19. That's the first of our accidental causes of death. And, and uh, worldwide, it's the greatest accidental cause of death. Although in the United States, uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in the last number of years, uh, 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 opiate specifically, uh, drug overdoses, mostly opiate overdoses, have uh, overtaken road injury as the, the main accidental cause of death. And that's, that's pretty scary. So when people talk about an opioid crisis, that's what they mean. Uh, you know, it takes a lot to kill more people than road injury. Uh, this one uh, gives people sometimes giggles when they see it on on the list, right? You know, because just the word diarrhea, right? Uh, but but yeah, no, I mean that's it's it's part of the top ten, uh, and and largely you're dealing with places that don't really have uh, uh, you know sand, uh, clean clean water, right? If you if you have a lack of clean water, um, you can absolutely die from a diarrheal infection, um, and that's uh, that's still an issue, especially in some of the poorer and more rural areas of the world that don't don't have access to uh, you know sort of water treatment and you know clean running water things like that. It's a, it's a major problem. And of course, the first pathogen really uh, that, that gets named at least all by itself, uh, tuberculosis. And that, again, is, is uh, increasing. That's a, you know, it's a pretty scary disease and it, it can be it has a nasty habit of developing uh, resistances to antibiotics. But that's, again, 17 per 100,000 per year. And then you have to go down to lots and lots and lots of other uh, kinds of deaths before you get the first intentional cause of death, and that is suicide. Globally, the rate of suicide is 10 per 100,000 per year, right? And murder is all the way down at the number that we've seen before, 6.1, right? So if you're really going to worry about something kill, killing you, take care of your heart, take care of your lungs, take care of your brain, right? And don't kill yourself. You're, statistically speaking, you're twice as dangerous to yourself as everybody else in the world is to you. So stop being suspicious of everybody else and go like, you know, eat an apple, take a walk, do that sort of thing. Uh, you know, worry about what really matters, worry about the big stuff. Um, don't make major changes or major sort of uh, habits based on, on the, the more minor risks. Right. So uh, again, keep things in perspective, uh, look for the data and let the data be your guide.